I'm going to stop the share. Perfect. Okay, so I think I think we can probably start. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to this final lecture of our of our lecture series brought to you by the interior design and interior architecture programs. Uh, so we're really happy to see all of you again joining us. Uh, so today, uh, as usual, we'll have the talk by, by our guests and then we'll have a period of questions at the end. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to share them with us using the Q&A option in, in Zoom and I will allow you to talk at the end and to share your question. And so today we have a graduate of our program um, with us who, is, who also teaches in our program uh, currently. So we're really happy to have Sonia Bochart uh, with us uh, today. So she's um, a designer who has I think more than 25 years of experience in diverse uh, firm. And uh, she'll talk to us today about her work with uh, nature or thinking about the power of nature and, and design and how it can help us um, uh, create and, and heal our communities. And so this builds on, um, on some of the, the, the work that she's been doing uh, for groups such as the Interior Designs Healthcare and Wellness Council and the Adversary Council for the International Living Future Institute's uh, Biophilic Design Initiative. And she also serves as a board member, member of green, for Green Plans for Green Building. So you see that there's definitely a, an interest in kind of thinking about nature and the importance of nature for, to, to what we do as designers. So um, I welcome virtually uh, Sonia Bochart and uh, I'm, here you go. You're welcome to speak. All right. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm just going to get my screen set up here. Takes a little, little bit of a delay. And I, before I get started, can you kindly remind me um, how much time I should be speaking for today? Let's say about 45, 50 minutes so that we have enough time for, for questions after. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. I want to begin by first expressing my gratitude for being invited to share with you all today. And I'd like to also just begin by honoring and acknowledging that I was born, I live and I work in gratitude on the lands and the territories of the O'odham, Akama O'odham and the O'okam peoples to whom we owe a great debt. So I'd like to take you on a bit of a journey today as we explore the power of nature in design to heal and nourish our communities. So in my 25 year career as a designer, I have asked thousands of people this question. If you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would you be? So just close your eyes and I'm gonna ask that you imagine this place fully. Take in a nice, deep, expansive breath. Ah, and gently exhale. In imagining this place, what would you see around you? What is the quality of the light? Are there patterns, materials, textures, is there movement of the air? Can you just imagine the feel, the temperature of the air on your skin? What would the aroma be like in your place? So take it in fully. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Now, 
if you're like most people, you imagined yourself somewhere in nature. Ah, yes, maybe a place with an expansive ocean view or maybe a serene garden or perhaps amongst the trees, yes? Being in nature makes us feel fully alive. So we get this sense of vitality and inspiration, while at the same time, we are at peace and we are clear and grounded. And science confirms spending time in nature supports our minds and bodies to be at our best. Our heart rates and blood pressure regulate, stress is reduced, even our immune systems are activated. We thrive. But here's the problem. Yes, sadly, we are estimated in the US, as many of you probably know, it's becoming a common statistic um, that we are spending over 90% of our time inside. And many of these places, the places that we live, work, learn and heal, they're isolating us from nature. These environments are not helping us to thrive. They've actually created a vast divide from who we really are. These dynamic, sensory rich living beings that thrive on connection with the natural world. And this disconnect is harming us physically, mentally and emotionally. The walls that we have built around us are unhealthy and they are closing us down. But <laughs> there is good news. I'm here to tell you about a different way. A way for us to feel happier and healthier inside. Now, when I decided to study interior design, I was excited about the creativity and the stylish trends. But then I got a project in the interior design program here at ASU that truthfully I wasn't excited about. My last semester in school, we were assigned a project for an older hospital. I dreaded it. And at the same time, my father who I'm pictured with here was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. So as I designed this project here in the undergrad studies, I listened deeply at the same time to my father's experiences within the walls of the hospital as a patient, and they were disheartening. He told me about getting lost in hospitals and of being stressed, <laughs> of those artificial glaring lights. You know the ones. <laughs> and of these lovely gardens that he could see, but they were off limits to patients. And it was a tough year. Thankfully, my father did get better. That experience transformed me personally and as a designer. I could see how the physical design of the building could have supported my father when he needed it the most. And so this led me on a career as a healthcare designer for over 15 years. So understanding how design can help us to heal. And then I started designing beyond the walls of the hospital. I wanted to support well being before people had to go get healthcare in the first place. So my path as a designer committed to health and wellness was as clear as daylight. So the term used to describe the profound innate connection we have to the natural world is biophilia. It translates as love of life. And the theory of biophilia is this, having lived the majority of our lives deeply connected to nature, our relationship to the natural world is embedded genetically and biologically encoded within us. 
In fact, a wonderful example of the powerful impact that nature can have for us as humans is the concept of forest bathing or referred to in the Japanese term as Shinrin Yoku. And the expansive research that has been conducted related to forest bathing suggests that when we are immersed in a forest, we inhale the aromic compounds from plants called phytoncides. These can increase our number of natural killer cells a type of wet, white blood cell that supports the immune system and is linked with a lower risk of cancer. These cells are also believed to be important in fighting infections, inflammation, which is a common marker of disease. And so the concept of bringing nature inside or biophilic design promotes these innate human nature connections that we all have. But what do we do to transform these cold and harsh spaces? So I'd say the change is rooted in three primary concepts. And the first thing we need to do is we need to break down the walls and let nature in. We need sunlight, views, water, and plants. We need close and meaningful connection with the natural world every day. We need access to gardens and rooftop decks, plants and animals flourishing in and around our buildings. This exposure to nature substantially increases our creativity, our productivity, and even our happiness. We must blur the lines between inside and out. And yes, daylight. We need abundant sunshine to nourish our circadian rhythms, which regulate our sleep and our wake cycle, our moods and support our children's development. Research from multiple studies show daylighting can help us improve test scores by 10% and learning rates by 25% just by opening those blinds and letting in the light. And we need plants. In majestic forms such as dynamic green living walls and in small simple ways we must not forget the power of the potted plant. We need to say yes to life in our buildings. The second way to make this transformative change is that our buildings can't just look good. They must feel good. Our bodies have been so closed down, our senses forgotten in many of these spaces. So our buildings need to make us feel more alive. They need to awaken our senses. Natural materials, texture, color, sacred geometry, and fractal patterns. The repeating rich patterns found at various scales in the natural world. Research shows that experiencing these patterns help us to process information and at the same time think clearer and it promotes a sense of relaxation. And this does not need to cost more. This rich reclaimed wood table came in at the same price as a standard regular conference room table. We really can't afford to live any other way. And imagine restorative designs creating refuge with calming sounds of nature for quiet spaces in contemplation. Design that makes us feel alive. And third, to transform our spaces for life and living, we need buildings to remind us to care. This comes in natural, authentic design that creates beauty and a sense of awe. These are elements that become memorable. They create the places that we love. This makes us feel connected to each other and inspired.
Natural beauty in design is an inspirational language that speaks to us beyond words. It just feels right. You walk into a space and it's warm and it's comfortable and it's caring. And research shows the places that we find beauty, we are more likely to become emotionally attached. We become kinder, more compassionate, even more generous. And like I learned working on this project, often the best element to foster awe and wonder is art. Art that integrates community, culture, and place with local artists and natural and indigenous materials. Design that lifts the human spirit. <laughs> and finally, it is important for us to recognize these ideas aren't just for new buildings. They can and must be reimagined in our many existing spaces. Who would have known this revitalized modern office space used to be an old rundown adult bookstore? This is transformation. We are nature. And when we are surrounded by nature's patterns, we thrive. We don't need to wait until that next vacation or to travel to our favorite destination. We can get that same feeling in the spaces that surround and support us. By bringing in the power and inspiration of nature into the places that we live, work, learn, and heal, through the power of design, we will be healthier, happier, and more connected. And we will be better because of it. Now, I wanted to just root us all in the premise of biophilia and biophilic design and how I came to find myself immersed in this work. And I'm so grateful to all of the staff members that supported me on my educational path and my professional mentors. Um, that introduction was based off a, a, a TEDx talk I gave in the fall entitled, How Buildings Can Make Us Better. And so I'd like to invite you to be like nature. <laughs> You've been listening to me speak for about 15 mi minutes. So I'd like you to invite you to move, maybe take a deep breath. And really relax a little more. Just let your body soften, maybe stretch your arms up high, reach up, relax your shoulders. And I wanna transition us to the next part of the conversation. I'd like to talk more about what we need to do to really create this change. So as Carol Sanford, my favorite regenerative development educator and author reminds us, our world is dimensional. It is whole, alive, and continuously evolving but our inherent capacity to understand it in these terms has been mostly trained out of us in favor of analytical methods that dissect, compartmentalize, and lineate. And if we look at the trajectory of green building certification, we see this movement from doing less harm, which was certainly a move in the right direction of having less impact to this idea of doing good, which the Living Building Challenge or LBC sets us on. And just for reference, the Living Building Challenge is a green building certification program and a sustainable design framework that visualizes the ideal for the built environment. It uses the metaphor of a flower because the ideal built environment should function and cl as clearly and as efficiently as a flower. So LBC is bridging us to regenerative development and regenerative design, which is based on the understanding that the inner working of an ecosystem, so that means both people in place, 
social and ecological health that creates designs to regenerate or revitalize rather than deplete underlying life support systems and resources. That is regenerative development. And biophilia, biophilic design is nested within that. So as a response to how to integrate biophilic design into our projects and how it is nested within regenerative development, I would like to attempt <laughs> to share a short video on the experiential biophilic design process. Um, so if I run into any problems here or if sound is not working, please let me know. With biophilia, humans have an innate connection to nature. We seek out nature. And Phipps has been integrating that into all the work that they do. Phipps opened in 1893, and it's still one of America's premier public gardens. We've been connecting people to nature for, for 125 years. We just never connected the dots to our buildings. When we started the design for the Center for Sustainable Landscapes, we were pursuing the Living Building Challenge, which is the most rigorous green building standard in the world. We incorporated some biophilic elements, things like connections to nature and views of nature. But it wasn't until after we finished construction that we realized that there was so much more that we could have done with this whole idea of biophilic design. When we started our next design project, we decided to incorporate biophilic design workshops in the design process. And we did that about midway through the design. That got us really excited about the incredible potential there is with biophilia. By the time we got to this project, we asked ourselves, well, what would happen if we incorporated biophilic design from day one and used that as a primary focus for the design of that project? Mellon Park was originally the estate of the R.K. Mellon family, and after it was given over to the city as a park, it functioned as a venue for most of our adult education programs, and we are in the process now of trying to essentially do an adaptive reuse of that entire building. We're also going to be pursuing the Living Building Challenge, Lead Platinum, Well Platinum, and Sites Platinum for the project. We decided to follow a very intense integrative design process to make that happen. So if you look up in the dictionary the word to integrate. An integrated process requires seeing every aspect of that building and its site and its place as all deeply interrelated. So we had scheduled for this project five workshops. Biophilic design is the intentional fostering of human nature connection in the built environment. What we're really trying to do is to look at potential. Biophilic design is intentionally doing things with the design to put people back in a, a meaningful relationship with nature. It's an emerging field, but uh, it's an incredibly important concept. I've been working as a designer for over 20 years. And my experience has been that with the majority of our projects, the theory of biophilia has very much been an afterthought or kind of a checklist mentality. Historically, buildings have evolved to create a barrier between the human occupants and nature. Biophilia starts to try and reestablish that connection. We invite the participants to reconnect to nature in a very focused way. I like to lead the participants through mindfulness walks around the site. And the whole idea is that they're really awakening their senses to remember what it feels like to be outside. What is the science telling us? It's telling us that our bodies are profoundly and directly influenced by exposure and time around nature's patterns. The whole idea is to understand what is our role in, in nature as a part of nature, not separate from nature. The intense focus on biophilia absolutely changed the way conversations happened and the way that people thought about the building. How do we 
It's not just about what can we create with the building, but what does the site offer up? It was great to actually pay special attention to that. Experiential biophilic design workshops transformed the will of the team to come up with more innovative ways to connect people to the natural environment. I don't know how to explain it. It's a spiritual awakening. It does open up um, something mentally that allows you to really reach further. That can relate to more we start to get to this really organic, rich, problem-solving design thinking that is all centered around cultivating human nature connection. It was really interesting to see the changes from workshop to workshop, how our thinking has evolved and how the architects merge nature with the indoor environment. Our job through this process and through a focus on biophilic integration is to acknowledge all those levels and layers upon which we're interdependent with the world around us. There is a page called Together Again. It's the outdoor walled garden space and the interior botanic arts gallery looking as if it's one space. And that, I think, really sums up a lot of what we're trying to accomplish in the project. The entire design has changed dramatically from what I originally expected, and it's all linked back to this idea of connecting us to nature. Everyone can understand the song of a bird, the awe of a sunset, of an amazing space. It transcends political boundaries, culture, and time. It unifies us. The opportunity wouldn't exist without the owner and initial sort of seed of inspiration to say, we can do this. And it's essential that it's really led by the owner. The best place to incorporate biophilic design is at day one. Start the project with that intention and it will have an incredible impact leading up to an incredibly beautiful and wonderful finished product. I hope that wasn't too <laughs> choppy for you all. I hope it came through okay. Um, I'm gonna verbalize the process a little bit more for you and share some examples of how a co-creative process helps to establish biophilic design strategies for a project. So this experiential biophilic design human nature discovery process is required by projects to meet the living building challenge. It is certainly a value to any project, whether or not you're going to pursue a building certification. Uh, it is also referenced by the well building standard and it brings immense value to not only the project, but the project teams. Integrated early in a project attended by representation of all project team members, community, stakeholders, including nature as a stakeholder, in a co-creative process allows for greater inclusiveness, equity, and diversity in the design process. And it considers the underserved in our communities. It also provides for greater and, and more innovative design solutions that respond specifically to the uniqueness or the essence of a place and its people. The principles of biophilic design explored in these discovery sessions or the people that, that participate in them, anywhere from the owner, the client, staff members, the architect, landscape architect, engineer, interior plantscapers, general contractors, interior designers. Uh, we've had historians in them, biologists, activists, artists. Um, they all take part of these visionary workshops. And in facilitating these integrative biophilic design workshops over the past decade, I recommend and I reference the late Dr. Stephen R. Kellert of Yale University and his partners that have classified biophilic design into six primary design elements 
and over 70 associated attributes uh, or patterns. So I'd like to share an overview of a few different types and scales of pro projects that feature holistic human nature connection integration that evolved from these experiential biophilic design discovery process. The first one and near and dear to my heart is located in the heart of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens, which you heard a little bit about. Phipps strives to demonstrate that human and environmental health are intrinsically connected and that, the sustainable, and that sustainable action is key to ensuring that these connections are harmonious, mutually beneficial and healthy for future generations. And I'd like to just make a side note at this point that there are still several, many thousands or of organizations that have these types of emissions that are in, in essence very connected to the earth, to the planet, to the well-being of both people and planet, and they still haven't um, set their path to meet that aspiration with their designs. So I deeply respect the work that has been done by Phipps and actually the work that they're, they're leading there on, not only the design of their projects, but how they function as an organization. So in considering the essence of this place and of the, the land there, I'd also like to recognize and honor the Shawnee and the Osage people who first inhabited the, these lands. This image shows how originally, oh, nope, it's this image. <laughs> oh, I, I, I think I took it out. I do apologize. The, um, I was, I was trying to minimize my slides, but I had one. You're gonna to have to use your imagination. Um, it showed the image, it showed an image of the building um, on the original site, which was this um, brownfield site. And the building was flat, windowless, and a cinder block warehouse. And Phipps Conservatory and Partners goals was to adapt the former public works building into an exhibit staging center or the ESC that would enhance the health and wellness of staff members who use it and to inspire guests and visitors. And for decades, though the facility sat unused adjacent to an otherwise lush and vibrant campus where others might have torn the building down, Phipps saw a challenge. With thousands of old building stock around the world, if we could transform this old cinder block building into one of the greenest buildings in the world, it would prove that any building can become a regenerative development that fosters human connection in the natural world. This ESC claim, um, aims to achieve LEED Platinum, Well Building Platinum, and Full Living Building Challenge certification. So in this image, you see the green roof over the vestibule that helps to blur the line between the building and the natural world and manage the stormwater. The ESC features a yoga court, an outdoor semi-sheltered space that offers vistas of the site landscaping. A series of sandstone columns are evocative of a forest. Yoga court features intricate inlay in the shape of one of nature's hallmark forms, the spiral and recycled colorful glass in fractal patterns catch the sun, giving the spiral an aliveness and iridescence that changes with the patterns of the daylight. Now keep in mind this image here was taken just when the building um, completed so that core 10 steel hasn't quite patinaed and the green walls on the um, building exterior have not grown in yet. So it's it's still in a, a kind of an immature state. It's, it is evolving. The lagoon adjacent to the ESC is used to store rainwater and replicate the natural treatment process of marsh and wetlands on the site. Chemical free sanitary water is recycled, treated through a constructed wetland 
that uses natural plants and microbes, as well as sand filters and UV lights. And the lagoon provides for discovery, rich and diverse habitat, and places for intimate pockets of micro respite. So that's shifting us out of the fight or flight response of the body and into our more calm and restorative nature. And spirit of place, inspired by Phipps effort to soar to new heights, a series of stainless steel cedar wax wing sculptures grace the exterior of the ESC, contrasting dynamically with the core 10 steel cladding. The sculpture's lead bird there on the left is posed flying away from the flock to symbolize that Phipps does not follow the flock or conventional ways of doing things and is always seeking out the best possible way to a future that achieves the highest standards for human and environmental health. And I'd like to shift you now to an example of a larger scale project. Um, this is the recently completed Candida Building for Innovative Sustainable Design at Georgia Tech. It is focused on education and research. It was just awarded full Living Building Challenge certification and features classrooms, labs, a 16 person seminar room, a design and maker studio, a 176 person auditorium, a rooftop apiary, pollinator garden, an office space for co-located programs and a coffee station. The early biophilic design workshop included over 60 participants and led to this dynamic learning space with abundant natural wood, a timber structure, a monumental stair that leads to the rooftop gardens and classrooms, adjacent edible gardens and a vibrant eco commons. And moving you to a smaller scale now is a recently completed project entitled The Loom House. This project is located on a beautifully landscaped bluff overlooking the Puget Sound. Loom House is, is an extensive res, renovation of a 1960s Northwest style home on Bainbridge, Washington. It is also pursuing full living building challenge certification. The 3000 square foot residence consists of an existing North and South home that is completely renovated to improve the building envelope, provide self-sufficient systems and offer updated interiors while maintaining the original architectural character of the home. The 15 person full day on-site biophilic design workshop Led, through the, led to the thoughtful landscape improvement imp, implement, implemented for the existing landscape, which consists of ornamental plantings of J Japanese maples and flowering trees. A new elevated walkway will curate a path through the mature 200 foot tall evergreens over an installation of natural stone in a stream bed and a variety of edible berries as well as vegetables and foraging Forest will provide urban agriculture for the community on the property. And furniture and furnishings made of natural materials crafted by local artists will create a comforting interior for creation, respite, and refuge. Moving broadly to the city scale, it's essential that we recognize that it is estimated by 2050 66% of the world's population is expected to live in cities. We must focus both on the building level and the city scale within each other. Biophilic Cities, which is an organization and network that partners with cities, scholars, and advocates from across the globe, builds an understanding of the values and contributions of nature in our cities. The organization facilitates a global network of partner cities working collectively to pursue the vision 
of a natureful city within the uniqueness and diverse environments and cultures. These partner cities, including Phoenix, are working to, to concert and to conserve and celebrate nature in all of its forms and the many important ways in which cities and their inhabitants benefit from the biodiversity and wild urban spaces present in our cities. So it is about people, it is about the land, and it's very much on supporting the biodiversity and the other species that make it such a rich habitat. I wanted to share a, a page of just a few resources, being websites, a few papers, books, and a highlight for me, the recent documentary entitled My Octopus Teacher. I watched it this week, it's lovely. Um, there are certainly a wide variety of methods to richen and to deepen your understanding and practice of biophilia, of biophilic design and of regenerative development. But mostly our work in creating these spaces that are transformative will take a change in our mindset. So a vision of integration within our communities, our land, and our precious resources with them and not in dominance of the natural world. As we know, we are nature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia. I do appreciate it. And um, I'm going to go through the Q&A portion of the um, lecture series. I'm going to open it up to Betty. She did put in the, um, the chat a question, so I'm going to allow her the opportunity to ask her question. And so with that, Betty, go ahead and Okay, Betty, I think you're still on mute if you want to unmute. Okay, that's all right. So I'll ask the question. Um, so Betty was um, asking a for your personal opinion about the beauty topic for the LBC certification and how you measure beauty, um, which is completely subjective um, and personal in reference to every single person who watches an object and she put can't. Um, who decides what is beautiful and what is not in a biophilic design? Um, Keller talked about beauty, um, but what is it to um, one regulated by bio biology? Um, and then, so she said also, Sonia talks about um, now beauty um, so which are the standards now? Thank you. Okay. Well, I will tell you what I'm familiar with and how I view the topic. Um, and I have been questioning that my entire career. I, I, I do know that the living building challenge makes, makes the notation or sets the foundation that the design response needs to be or should be based on the essence of the place and the project and in deep respect to that place. So they're looking for within the certification that narrative and that description that the design response is harmonious with the place, that it is integrating ideas of community, that it's building community, that you know, it's taking ideas of local art, local vegetation, natural habitat, reflecting that in meaningful ways on the building. And I believe in many ways that is the concept of beauty for those projects. And certainly it is stemmed in the natural world. And, you know, there is research, I would cite specifically Roger Ulrich with Texas A&M, which I've been following his research for years, studying the effect of natureful art, landscape, 
photography very clear versus abstract art, which some might find beautiful. I find beautiful in certain aspects, but there is a certain response um, from the human body, physical physiology, um, our perception that, at least in the studies that were led by Dr. Ulrich, um, seem to indicate aggravation, like severe aggravation um, to patients that were viewing the abstract artwork. So, and I, I do believe that there have been um, several studies following that that um, replicated those types of concepts and understanding and did point in the direction of more clear art um, photographs or, you know, even you know, different mediums for artwork and ideas of, of nature that are very clear to us that we can easily process and understand. And the same type of research has been done in different ways on fractal patterns and certain densities of fractal patterns that um, have, they facilitate changes in the, the brain. And that's something I'm really interested in right now is the neuroscience aspects of when we're experiencing different elements of beauty and different aspects of nature and different even details with how things are crafted and created in the built environment, how that changes, how we're processing information and into like the prefrontal cortex and to these higher elevated levels of thinking and being and calmer states. So I think there's a lot of science to back it up now that it is more about nature and it is very much about place. I hope that helped. Great, thank you. And um, when starting your biophilic design, where do you typically start first when you're kind of creating your projects? What's your, your mode of inspiration? Um, where would you um, like to kind of start first um, in regards to that? I really like that question. <laughs> um, so, I would consider it kind of a, um, a foundation of holding kind of different things all at one time. I by no means consider myself an expert coming onto a project for biophilic design. I consider myself more of a resource or a facilitator because in order to create the optimal biophilic design strategy for a project, it needs to be co-created and you know as as was shared with the a little bit in the video and in the explanation that's not just going to come from the architect or the interior designer it's the engineers at the table and it's the biologist and it's the artist and it's the interior designer it's like it's um i feel like i'm forgetting a few others of course it's the owner i mean i think the starting point for me is to to have that day, have that experience where the program of the project is discussed in parallel with the essence of that place. You know, when we're, when we're out on site and we're looking at a place or looking at a project in the land, we're looking at not only what's there, what are the patterns that are there that can really blur the lines of the project and make it a really rich um, um, place for humans in the natural world. It's quite often about the, um, the human role of those team members of being really intentional and really aware also of what is missing. You know, to have a full experience. When we worked on um, one of the projects for Phipps, you know, there was a, a recognition of the importance of keeping um, the skylights open, really open in one of their projects because they don't get that light a lot in the winter. So when there was a, a response for the artwork, it was like maintaining that sky was really important. Maintaining that light was really important. Um, on other projects, we might be missing the sounds of birds on site. So we wanna bring in that native planting. We wanna bring in that biodiversity. Um, so the starting point is a co-creative process that is honoring people and place. And again, as I mentioned, it is incredibly critical that we're bringing in the underserved we're bringing in, we're thinking about the potential of the people and the other species that will be 
you know, inhabiting that space. And we're thinking about the underserved and we're thinking about um, what we can learn from the indigenous cultures too, about understanding place. Great, thank you very much for that. And um, I have another question coming. Um, I'm gonna open this one up to Tao. Um, so then that way he can ask this question directly to you. And... Hi, Sonia. Uh, hi, uh, this is Tao. Um, I was in one of your class a few years back when we did the SCNM. Um, but my question is, uh, considering how the world is moving towards a um, more sustainable future as a whole, what are some existing or new ways that the construction and development industry can use biophilic designs to contribute to, I guess, a more sustainable future? I hope that wasn't a mouthful. <laughs> no, you you mentioned the um, you mentioned developers. Yeah, just the construction industry. Yeah, in general. Yeah. So I think that is um, incredibly important. Um, I've been in conversation with more developers. They're seeing they're they're starting to see the value. Um, so. <laughs> I, uh, I think it's great that they're starting to consider how they can, um, <laughs> and I say this carefully, how they are able to start setting some guidelines. You know, I like frameworks. I don't think they need to be so limiting because um, they also, of course, need to be very deeply responsive to place. But if they have that in their vision for their projects from day one, then we'll be able, they will be able, their architects will be able, their team members will be able to um, optimize those strategies. And again, the trouble is so much of that is coming into the conversation late, or it's just um, kind of prescriptive in nature. Um, team members are trying so hard to take that research and connect the dots and it's, oh, natural light is the answer or it's um, views to the outdoors or it's bringing veget veget vegetation. It's like, yes, and it's gotta be more of that exploration. So I would love to see more, um, I would love to see the broader adoption and awareness of biophilic design. So all teams, developers, contractors, <laughs> all building types are able to have those conversations early on and in a really, profound ways, uh, ways of discovery. Um, I think that's our, that's our best way of creating these places that our communities are really gonna connect to and they're gonna care about. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. And with that, I, it comes to a close and I did wanna say thank you very much for the um, opportunity and the, the lecture series. Um, I did attend also one of your, um, your conferences. So my question would be when's like your next conference that's coming up and um, I got a great amount of value out of it and definitely um, would like to continue to increase that um, awareness as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you. It's again a, a pleasure to be here supporting my alma mater and my community. And, um, you know, it's so strange in this global pandemic how we're, how we're functioning in groups and teams and education, right? So much of it is online. Um, I'm, I'm continuing to do more webinars on different um, ways of educating teams on the research and patterns of biophilic design. I think my next session is um, for an organization called American Horticulture and it's in July. So that's gonna be fun. We're talking about, um, it's a show called Cultivate and we're going to be talking about what are the barriers to implementing biophilic design, which is really important. So. Um, again, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it today and appreciate you all being here. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Sonia, for, for this. I think Jose had a few words to say to both thank you, but also to kind of close this lecture series. So, so Jose, the floor is yours. 
All right. Well, thank you, Sonja. <clears throat> it is always um, impressive the energy that you bring and, and the <clears throat> care that you have about this topic. Um, I wanted really to thank all the students and the, I mean, those that were part of this listening and contributing with questions, and particularly to uh, my colleagues, Olivier and Michelle, and also to Ray, that was the <clears throat> genius behind all of this, uh, that put together all of this. And um, Sonia, again, um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have an, an alum. Um, and and the, the, the year that you graduated, um, I arrived to this institution. So <laughs> um, <clears throat> It, it, it is wonderful to see you returning, but in this case, as um, an expert on a topic. Thank you very much to everybody. And more likely will be that we will have um, a different session and lecture next academic year. Uh, this has been very uh, productive for all of us. Thank you all. Bye-bye uh, now. <laughs>